Dick Gooding. I'm your host for today's edition of Veterans Remember. We have had a series of uh, veterans who have joined me for a discussion uh, over the past number of weeks. And we've had an opportunity to visit with them uh, both in their early days before they uh, became service members and then while they served in, in, uh, in the various forces uh, of serving your nation. Uh, it's been a very enjoyable and enlightening experience and we hope that uh, your children will have the opportunity to learn a little bit about the, uh, the things that their parents and, and relatives have done. Uh, tonight we have a, uh, we're having a, a slight different departure from a one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion and uh, we have uh, a family here with us tonight. We have Dr. John Duffy and uh, Major Rich Duffy, uh, father and son and uh, uh, both Hopkintonians uh, for a long time, and we welcome the two of you uh, to Veterans Remember, and uh, we hope to be able to learn a little bit about your experiences uh, in the service, and uh, maybe, John, I'll start off with you and ask you a little bit about uh, your pre-military experience and uh, what caused you to go into the service to begin with. Well, it was very interesting that um Going into the service in those days, and we're talking 65 years ago, uh, was almost an accident of, of, of the time you were born. Uh, uh, people I grew up with and was in high school with were actually older than I was. I graduated from high school when I was 17 years old, and the older people had uh, actually joined the service before they left high school. Uh, it was a very interesting time uh, in the late teen years uh, in those days because you a part of the country coming together in those days uh, in the total effort for the war effort. And uh, I can recall things that, uh, that uh, I was involved in, uh, in that um, whenever uh, there was rationing in those days, uh, so uh, as the oldest child in the family, I had the responsibility uh, to be in the grocery shopping area and had to know the uh, the price and the number of ration points for every item that we buy, and the, especially canned goods. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, my folks would depend upon me, and they'd give me the ration book and the money, and I'd go shopping, and I had to, we couldn't run out of ration points. Also, sugar was rationed. Uh, it was nothing to stand in line for a, an hour to buy a pound of butter. Uh, gasoline was rationed. Uh, there were three types of stickers that uh, you could have depending upon your priority in the war effort. There were A, B, and C stickers. Uh, the lowest priority was A. We had an A, and that was five gallons of gasoline a week. And that's all you got. Um, then, um, another item on the automobiles was we, I grew up, grew up in Fall River. That was close enough to the coast so that uh, we had to offset the phenomenon that was called silhouetting and, and uh, of, the, of the ships by, um, by the lights from the cities uh, so that the, uh, the, the ships were silhouetted by the, by the lights from the cities, the submarines, the German submarines would sink and they did a lot, especially 1943 was the worst year. And what we had to do was we had to paint the top half of our headlights black, uh, especially the nearer the coast you go, then you'd have to do that. Um, the, um, uh, then as we uh, graduated, graduated from high school, um, the, uh, there was an opportunity to, have a, uh, to join the Army, which, which I did. I was just, uh, had just turned 17, joined the Army, and they had an educational program where you would uh, be, be going to school for a year uh, until you reached 18, and then you go to active duty. So by the time I signed up for the Army, that was, and I reported to a college, actually, uh, uh, on August 1st, and then the Japanese gave up later that month. I don't think there was any connection there, but... Uh, well, Hank Alessio <laughs> certainly wanted me to explore that, because he was, <laughs> he was certain that the Japanese surrendered sh shortly after you joined. Yeah, I know. I was out at Mass State. It made a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just, just to continue, before... Um, uh, the way the program was, it wound down because the war had ended, so they, they consolidated people uh, more and more uh, to fewer and fewer colleges. We did a mass state for, for six months, then they were, we were sent to Norwich University uh, in Vermont 
for, for three months, and then Texas A&M for three months. But uh, I can say that I was thinking I received my first indoctrination into the real army at Norwich, because um, uh, one of the things I'd done ever since I'd been very young, I'd played the trumpet. And so I was made the bugler wherever I went. And I had a, uh, a habit in, uh, in Mass State that after I played taps, that uh, I would play a, a tune or two from Harry Jane's repertoire. <laughs> and over the campus, and uh, the girls had moved in on a, on a, up on the hill in a, in a dormitory, and they used to send me requests. So I would honor their request, we'd play that. Now, I went to Norwich, and I said, that'd be a great idea to try that there. So that last, lasted one night. I went out on the parade ground, played taps, and then played you made me love you, or whatever the song was, Harry James was, and in two seconds I had the master sergeant, real army, out chasing me literally around the, around the, <laughs> and that's the last time I did that. <laughs> so that was frowned upon in Norway. Very, very strongly, very yeah. strongly. Rich, I imagine the uh, circumstances surrounding you joining the service were quite different than your dad's. Could you share that a little, a little of that with us? Sure, sure. I had, um, it was different, but it also, my dad's experiences I had come to know, and uh, formed a positive, positive influence in my life, where the military was always always in a positive light. Uh, but I joined in a peacetime army. Uh, it came out of the into the early '80s. Um, there was more a growing positive image of the military, and my brother preceded me uh, by joining the infantry. And seeing his experience, positive experience, I realized I wanted to follow in those footsteps, if you will, and. You know, from my days in Boy Scouts, I enjoyed the outside and I enjoyed that type of environment. So I sought uh, scholarships. I sought, I sought an ROTC scholarship. The school I went to supported that program, that being Providence College. Once I got in, I went right into the our Reserve Officer Training Corps program and received a scholarship at the end of my sophomore year for two years. And through that training, uh, training down at Fort Bragg, uh, my at the end of my junior year, going into my senior year, and was selected to join the Military Intelligence Corps. And that basically formed the basis of my experience there. Uh, probably the, it was a tough and demanding course in between the junior and senior year. And we found ourselves, as you could probably readily imagine from your experience, up on a hilltop and patrolling. And uh, we were encountered, we encountered basically a thunderstorm that came out of nowhere. It was good that it broke the oppressive heat. Unfortunately, for a friend of mine and I, we were in the path of a lightning strike. So oh. we were able to spend an evening at the, the medical aid station just getting checked out. And you glowed for about a week. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we, we had a minor, thankfully just minor, effects from it. But as soon as they realized we were good, they gave us a glass of water and told us to go back out to the field. <laughs> there, was, there would be no slacking and no hanging around. It was work to be done. So There's that, plenty of field at Fort Sill, as I recall. Oh, there's thankfully a lot, <laughs> yeah, with all the, all the artillery that tends to go astray. Yeah. Uh, well, when you, uh, after you finished your, your training, your initial training, uh, uh, where did you have the opportunity to serve? Well, I was commissioned in the reserves, and I had a month off, mm -hmm. and I joined, I went active duty as soon as I reported to Fort Huachuca uh, in the Huachuca Mountains in southern Arizona. It uh, was a, it was quite an adjustment to make coming out of this area with lots of trees, tall trees, oaks and pines and whatnot. And you get down to southern Arizona with scrabby trees and the very low plants, if any, and the very, very hot. Uh, so it took a little of adjustment, but you know, you begin to, to like that type of environment. And much like my father, when we got toward the end of my time at Fort Huachuca and preparing to leave, that's when the Operation Desert Storm was preparing. Desert Shield was already in place. And you were looking at the beginning of another war. Mm. And uh, the last week of our time at Fort Huachuca, they canceled everyone's flight to their next duty assignment. So we stood in the line on the last day at Fort Huachuca for about 12 hours. We graduated, got our certificates, and then we stood in line waiting to get new flights. So we finished there, and I drove back across the country with a friend of mine. And in January, three days after the air war started, I flew off to Germany. Uh, to join my new unit in the 5th Corps headquarters in Frankfurt, Germany, and was greeted by patrols and dogs and armed guards at the gates looking at every, every package and every bag that came through. Hmm. Uh, so it was the beginnings of, of my time in Germany. Yeah. Well, Dr. Duffy, you uh, 
Uh, you served a couple of times. You, uh, you, you, that, that's you, true. Uh, after uh, after my, my college stint, I, I uh, you know reported to Fort Dix, right. uh, New Jersey. Then the, uh, because I was going to the, uh, the the band training school, which was at Fort Lee, Virginia, I reported there. And uh, uh, as part of the, the uh, indoctrination, if you will, or introduction to the Army, the real Army at, at uh, Fort Dix, uh, we were all presented with a couple of, of volumes. Uh, and uh, I, I thought I'd, I was actually able to, to find oh. them. One I'd forgotten I'd given to Richard to take to Iraq. And I, fortunately, he brought it with him so I can show you. Well, that's interesting. But this is the one that all, all, the, all the Army guys got called Army Life, yeah, 1944 by General George Marshall, and there's everything in there from, from personal hygiene to regulations to uh, a form for your last will and testament, pay grades, pay grades, it's 175 pages here, believe it or not, and everything is in there. The other, the other volume that's given to us that I thought, this is, this is the one I gave to Rich to take. I want to read something here okay. by, by Mike, just sure. from, from the inside. It's uh, from the White House, Washington, D.C. To the members of the Army, as Commander-in-Chief, I take pleasure in com commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries, men of many faiths and diverse origins have found in the sacred book words of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration. It is a fountain of strength and now, as always, an aid in attaining the highest aspirations of the human soul. Dated March 6, 1941, very sincerely yours, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Wow. That's quite a... Everybody That's quite got, a treasure. Everybody got one. Is that right? Yes, and I couldn't remember where it was until I remember I gave it to Rich to take to, to Iraq with him. And he brought wow. it back up for them today, so we have that. Well, boy, thank you very much for sharing this with us. Uh, the people in the audience uh, uh, may not be able to see everything that's in it, but it's certainly a, a treasure, and I'm, I'm certain that the yeah, two of you... Yeah, it was wonderful, the fact that uh, he gave that to me 48 years to the day that he deployed. I deployed to Fort Dix to get ready to go. 48 years to 48 the day. 48 years to the day. Yep. Did, you, did you realize that at the time? Yeah, yeah when he, it was yeah. Yeah. August 12th, and we're, we're both August 12th. Yeah. Oh, for crying out loud. Well, you're, you're, uh, uh, you went to dental school, at some, or college and dental school, somewhere in between stints I, yeah. in the, in I, the I service? Can I back up one time a little bit sure. back, into the, back into the 40s? Absolutely. Uh, because we had, the family had, uh, relatives, right, two aunts, who were Meridol missionaries. They were each prisoners of the Japanese. One was in Korea and was, uh, was exchanged uh, for other prisoners uh, in 1942, early in the game, in the, by, on the Swedish ship Gripsholm. So she came home. The other was in Manila. And she was a prisoner for three and a half years. She was at Santo Tomas, uh, which is a university, and they had a hospital there. So the sisters were able to help uh, in the hospital. Then, uh, in 1944, uh, they transferred them to a, to a prison camp called Los Banos, which is 45 miles south of, of Manila. And uh, she was rescued in a very famous raid now by the 11th Airborne, <clears throat> which, along with rangers in amphibious vehicles, conducted a surprise raid at the insistence of, of General MacArthur, who was afraid that those prisoners were going to be killed by the Japanese. And it was... It was um, uh, it was a very successful raid. She got out successfully and made it back okay. And when she came back, she gave me a couple of little treasures here. She says she took them from a Japanese soldier who was dead before she left the camp. It's two pieces of Japanese government occupation money from the Philippines, World War II. 100 pesos and 10 pesos. Wow. I'm sure that's not worth worth a lot of money, but it's sure worth a lot of uh, well, maybe a, a lot of memento. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. it is. yeah, yeah. So I always kept sure. those. But I just wanted to. Well, that's that. that's yeah, very interesting. Later, later on, I was uh, you know I uh, discharged from the army, went to went to dental school, and uh, uh, it's a very interesting thing because I like to say I'm I'm a veteran tw of two wars by an act of Congress, <laughs> because the Congress determined at what point that you'd be, that we could be cut off. And in the first instance, it was 1947, and I was in the service in 1947, so more after World War II. The same thing happened with the Korean War, that I was, uh, uh, I was in dental school. I just, after dental school in 1953, I joined the Public Health Service and was assigned to the United States Coast Guard. So as a member of the Coast Guard, then I'm a veteran of the Coast Guard, but only by act of Congress, 
because I was in the Coast Guard when they extended it, and I was, I was, still, I was still in the Coast Guard in 1956. So, that's, so they extended it that far, so that's how I'm a veteran of two wars, in quotation, wars. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't think we need any quotations, <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Duffy. Uh, your service and, and all of our veteran service is well respected and well thought of. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that some people saw combat, uh, you know, isn't particularly relevant as it relates to the, the things that are so near and dear to everyone uh, as part of their service. And, and certainly your service is, is no less honorable and, and significant than anyone else's. And, uh, you know, we certainly, certainly thank that. Rich, uh, when you were in Germany, uh, uh, you must have been uh, on your way to Iraq. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It was interesting in the sense that when we were assigned, we were reassigned, if you will, when we were waiting to head out to uh, Germany. But I arrived to Fifth Corps, and Seventh Corps was the unit, was the Corps headquarters that was assigned to go uh, fight the war. So that many of the units, many of the infantry and the armor units that ended up in the initial assault in Desert Storm were out of Fifth Corps. So I ended up in a headquarters that didn't go. Uh, it did have an effect in the sense that shortly after the war, the land war ended, when the offensive ended, the army, excuse me, the military wanted to go back and to see how all our new weapons had done, all our new precision guidance weapons. So a month in, my boss was taken, uh, and I was placed into a captain's position as a second lieutenant at Corps headquarters. And it was stressful, but it was very a great opportunity. But we were there through time. You got to learn the many different aspects of intelligence. Uh, but probably one of the more fascinating times when uh, you had the insurrection in Russia against Putin, not Putin, excuse me, uh, Yeltsin. And we got to monitor the situation very closely and see what was going on and keep our, our subordinate units involved. In other words, the units that work for Fifth Corps. Uh, so that was excellent, uh, getting able to be part of that. And then like anything else, you change over and uh, went over to more of a maintenance role. But at the same time, you're still in touch with the military intelligence. And you, you get to know how the Army works. So I worked through those different areas. And in the last year, I ended up in electronic warfare. And the last summer, we spent the entire summer at a training area prepared to go into the, to into the Balkans. So we went through and had our DNA taken. And then we had it taken again. And then we get up early to go training, and then we train, and it was all hinging upon a peace treaty. That, as it turns out, ended up getting signed for another four years. But you spend the summer training, 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 training. This uh, was still in Germany now? Yeah, still in Germany. This is mm -hmm. 1994. And at the end of the, we returned to September, and then the Army came out and declared its cuts. So I decided that time had come to try, try something new. And I was due for a changeover anyway to come back to the States and go to my next, uh, next military officer school, what they call the advanced course. Right. And I said, well, time for a change of venue. So that's when I went back to Providence College to pursue a master's degree and went to the, what they call inactive reserve. So you're on a list where if they need you, they'll call you, which, many, which really wasn't used a lot then, but has been used more in the recent conflict, especially with military specialties that are low on the active, in the active army, in which they don't have a lot of soldiers. So three years in the inactive reserve, and I joined the National Guard in the field artillery. So I got a wonderful trip out to Fort Sill to learn all about firing weapons. Of course, it's a lot of calculus involved. So I had to dig back into my least favorite subject <laughs> and learn, learn, enough to, <laughs> learn enough to fire a shell accurately, or at least to make sure the people who are firing them for me uh, could do that. Uh, but it was, it was an excellent course, and that kind of led me up to uh, essentially take a new post and a command post. Uh, and right after that is when we deployed for Iraqi freedom in August of 2004. Now, was General Schwarzkopf in charge of the, the Army in Iraqi freedom? He was. Yeah. I had, uh, I had him as an instructor in college. He uh, taught solids and mechanics uh, uh, back in, well, it was far too long ago. It was in 1966. Yeah. But uh, the guys uh, that had, had him uh, said it was phenomenal, he was straightforward. He was a phenomenal man. He was a lieutenant colonel at the time, and uh, uh, I had a lot of respect for him. 
Oh yeah, very intelligent. Yeah. yeah no so, nonsense. So uh, what did you do while you were in Iraq? So once we get there, I was the base defense opera, I worked for base defense. We mm -hmm. were in charge of the defense of the, what was called the Victory Base Complex. And uh, it was about four or five miles from the area best known, and that's the Green Zone. Uh, but we were our base basically were a cluster of bases surrounding the airport. And we were responsible for overseeing uh, this defense. My job was a plans officer. So I had to review all the planning going on at the base uh, as it related to base defense. Um, mass casualty response to respond to terrorist attacks, vehicle borne, uh, IEDs, uh, IEDs, any kind of I, I, IEDs, or uh, any kind of attack on the base, mm -hmm. as well as medical responses within the base, because we were at the time attacked daily with rockets and mortars. Uh, it would usually be a farmer was paid, either paid or threatened with harm to his family if he didn't put out uh, these ho homemade launchers. And he was told to point them into some direction, and he would go there and he'd set them off and run away. And our patrols would go out and confiscate the uh, whatever is left behind. And the farmer would get paid in cash uh, what they had promised him. So my job was to make sure we were able to, to respond to those things. For example, I'd set up a plan then end up used as a primary response when a vehicle exploded at the airport entrance. And we were able to respond enough where the enemy couldn't make use of the, make an opportunity. And it basically turned into nothing and there were no more attacks at that point for a while. Mm. Uh, so about halfway, you had a change of divisions. And when the new division came in, they brought their own troops with them to work. Right. Uh, and that pushed us up to, we volunteered to work in the expanding headquarters in Mosul. It's in the Kurdish area? And uh, just, actually just on the line. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on who you speak with, it's uh, either on the Kurdish area or an area that the Kurds would like to have. That was still an ongoing situation. So that was the assistant operations officer for the division. And then I took over as a battle major running the, the uh, day and then evening shifts. In other words, monitoring the battle and making sure the general was aware of what was going on and waking, unfortunately, having to wake up the general when things weren't going very well. I mentioned to you uh, just before uh, we started taping uh, that I had served in a similar position in uh, Vietnam in the 4th Infantry Division, uh, which certainly is far more famous uh, in Iraq than it was in Vietnam at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I can often remember going up to the general's uh, trailer and waking him up uh, yeah. after I'd been screened by a couple of lieutenant colonels first, of course, but to let him know of uh, some intelligence activity. And uh, it was always a fascinating time. I don't know whether you had the same uh, situation or not. It is. We had, uh, it was very, very fascinating because you were getting into a whole new dynamic within the headquarters where lawyers and civil affairs, these type of organizations which didn't have a lot of play before. Suddenly, when, when we wanted to fire artillery, we had to go see the lawyer to make sure that it fit within mm -hmm. the law of war. And if that, everybody else said okay, then I'd go tell the general what the parameter was and request his permission to fire. And most of the time, it was yes, or most of the time, the other part of the time, I would just deny requests because I knew they wouldn't pass muster right away. Of course, having my intel background was a, was a bonus sure. in that um, being on the operations side, I had to know what was going on in the intel side. And uh, well, having been on that side of the house, you know that intel tends to be very hush hush about what they know, even when other people need to know it. So at 4:30 in the morning, I would partake of their briefing to the higher headquarters and you know get that information. Sure. And I'd sneak back and I would give it to my boss, so he would be aware when the general had his briefing. Oh. So nobody would be caught unawares. <laughs> Now, John, uh, did you serve uh, for an extended period of time in inactive reserves or in active reserves? I was in, I was in the active reserve for a very long time mm -hmm. and was in the public health service. And it was, was, was called active duty several times to, uh, to provide services in migrant uh, workers camps in Florida. Uh, there was a very strange thing that happened because I was, when, I was, um, uh, when I was discharged from the, uh, from the public health service, uh, I was... Uh, I uh, was the equivalent of the uh, army captain, a navy lieutenant, two stripes, and uh, then I served. And then I then there was a hiatus. And uh, in Washington, whatever the the, the powers would be, decided they're going to play down the inactive reserve. So I didn't hear anything. Uh, but then, 
it must have been 20 years, and whether it was Ronald Reagan or whoever came in decided we're going to bring this back to this act, inactive reserve. So I got, an, I, got a, I got a notice saying you are now a captain. You now have four stripes, Army, Army colonel. So I never bought the uniform. <laughs> but, but when I went on, I went on active duty for the two or two or three weeks, I get a very nice pay. Very <laughs> as nice captain. Pay. That's right. <laughs> yes. That's very good. Well, uh, John and Rich, uh, we really thank you for the opportunity to uh, let you share uh, your stories uh, of your service, and we appreciate the fact that you continue to serve. And uh, Rich, uh, you're, you're obviously still in the service today, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we certainly uh, appreciate your continuing service and uh, want you to get that uh, silver oak leaf too. Let's get those oh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, oak leaves. That means a lot to you long term. So uh, we really do appreciate it. And uh, uh, folks in the audience, uh, I want to thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight or today during uh, uh, this opportunity to meet uh, father and son team, uh, the Duffies, Dr. John Duffy and Major Rich Duffy uh, on Veterans Remember. Thank you and have a good day. You found the channel and you've watched the shows. Now, find out how the magic happens on Inside H Cam. Twenty-six minutes you ever had. It's gonna fly by. All right. Tom, you ready to go? Yep. You're mostly on the guest with some over-the-shoulder shots. John, yeah. you're gonna be mostly on the host, but get ready to truck right and give me some shots with both of them. Gotcha. Burl, at 15 minutes in, we need to cue them for a 60-second break. Got it. Thanks. You want one of these? Send me an email. I'll pull a few names out of a hat. Finally, I keep. <laughs> Thank you. I don't get it.